Let's go. Have a good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Next week, we'll hear from our clients to assist in teaching us assembly language. That's next week. This week, today, I have the pleasure of introducing you to Ivan Vishasni from British Columbia, Canada. Just in case you didn't know what British Columbia was. And he's going to talk about the challenges faced by developers dealing with the student system. So let's welcome our speaker. Thank you. Uh, can you guys hear me back there? Yeah? Okay, good. Um, thanks, George, for the introduction. Thanks for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here to talk to you about some of my research. Um, so the work that I'm going to talk about actually is done with the collaboration of many different people. Uh, Perry, Albert, Patty, and Jenny uh, were students who were working with me. And then Yuri, Brun, and Michael are, in, are faculty at uh, UMass Amherst and University of Washington. Um, so yeah, I'm from UBC, British Columbia. And one of the things that I really care about is um, you know, whether we can empower developers, like your future selves, to build better distributed systems. Because uh, clearly, they're the future. And building them requires a different set of tools and different set of techniques. And so uh, that's largely what this talk is about. I realized, looking over the abstract, that I was going to talk about two tools. And uh, I decided to scale back a bit and talk about just one, but in a little bit more detail so that I'm not you know, rushing as much. So today I'll be primarily talking about a tool called Chivis. And uh, here's a URL. If you have a laptop, you can just go and like look at it. Um, but this, this URL will come up later. Awesome. So before, before we kind of get into fixing distributed systems, we have to figure out what a distributed system actually means. Like, what is it? And here's a quote by, uh, attributed to Leslie Lambert. Could be someone else. Leslie was the Turing Award winner uh, last year. And essentially, he thinks of a distributed system as a system uh, in which when you have a crash of a computer, um, you know, it interrupts you from getting any work done. Right? And it's a computer that you've never heard of. So essentially, this is like a really nice uh, operational uh, definition of what a distributed system is. And uh, you know, to, give, to give you a more concrete example, many of us are uh, users of Gmail. And you, as uh, a user of Gmail, access it through a browser. And you're completely unaware that actually, when you're interacting with Gmail, it's a distributed system underneath. And uh, in truth, um, uh, you, know, you only realize that this may be the case when you have an outage. So here's an outage that occurred in January 2014 uh, last year and impacted about 10% of users of Gmail. And it lasted for a significant amount of time, uh, long enough for people to actually go and complain about it on, on Twitter. Uh, there are really fantastic tweets, actually. My favorite one is, it's OK, folks. It's just a temporary uh, hiccup while the NSA downloads this week's data. <laughs> uh, and you know, the, from a user's perspective, this is really frustrating. Because a user actually, like the service goes down. They don't know why it's down. And the reason here was fairly complex. It had to do with uh, the way Gmail uh, networks computers within the data center. So really, you know, Gmail is composed of a number of services that are run across numerous machines within data centers that Google operates. And these services, you know, they index the data, they service requests, they uh, perform all sorts of training, you know, to make sure that you don't receive spam in your inbox. So there's many, many underlying services. So when a request by a user kind of hits uh, Gmail, it gets routed through a number of machines, possibly between multiple data centers, before there's a response. And so when, you know, when an issue occurs in this case, uh, you know, when the network goes down, then you know, some component that is completely kind of you know, obscure to the user impacts their day-to-day -day activity. Right? So that's one way of thinking about this definition. So here's kind of uh, my attempt to characterize uh, distributed systems. Some of these may be familiar to you. Some, some may not. So really, they belong to many different categories. So the, very, the one at the top is the one that's kind of the hottest area, which is just using distributed systems for parallel data processing. So here, examples include uh, systems like Hadoop and Spark. Uh, then you have systems within the data center that provide services that we all depend on, but you, know, you never really get to use in practice. And these are typically operated by uh, large companies. So for example, Amazon Dynamo, Google File System, Facebook Haystack, 
these are all custom designed systems specifically tailored to the workload you know, and applications that these companies operate. And then you have synchronization services that are a little bit more generic, like Zookeeper. So Zookeeper is a service uh, developed by Yahoo that is now used in numerous companies. And then if you kind of take things out to the wider area, then you get peer-to-peer -peer systems. So some of you may have used BitTorrent or even Tor, which is an anonymity service. Um, and then more familiar services uh, that are kind of core to the internet are things like the domain name uh, service, DNS, and also CDNs, uh, content distribution network. And of course, in the small, we have smaller file systems, like the network file system, which would operate within you know, this, this building, for example. So really, there's a range of these systems. And um, you know, one way in which you can think about the span of these systems is along the following four dimensions. So I, I took a stab at trying to figure out what is different about distributed systems. And so I think it has to do with the following four key features. I'll kind of go through these quickly. Um, and for each one of them, I, I kind of I give a plus, which is like, you know, what is, the, what is the feature that you get by having that capability? And then what is the drawback? What is the challenge, you know, as you build the system? So the first of these is heterogeneity. So a distributed system tends to include many different kinds of things, right? It tends to include many different computers. It tends to include many kinds of networks. And uh, if computers are spread around the world, then you get geographic diversity, right? And all of this diversity makes the system more resilient. So if a data center goes down on the West Coast, I still have a data center on the East Coast, right? So I can survive this failure. So diversity actually helps me. On the other hand, you have the difficulty of compatibility, right? So if you include different kinds of things, you have to make them interact. And that's a really challenging problem. Second feature is distributed state. So one reason people use distributed systems um, is that you have no central point of failure, or at least if you design it right. And the reason for that is that you know, the state for your application does not reside within a single machine. It's kind of spread. It's smeared across the different machines that are part of the system. And so uh, this gives it a, an interesting um, you know, full tolerance, but also gives it scalability. So as you add more machines, uh, you can add more state to your system. Right? So you have more capacity to store things. So that's great. On the other hand, when you have distributed state, it's really difficult to keep it coherent and synchronized. So this state coherence. Uh, requires uh, complex synchronization protocols like distributed consensus to actually make sure that the state you have locally at a machine is kind of in accordance to the global view of the system. Another feature is concurrency. Uh, you know, this is kind of a classic issue with distributed systems. And of course, this is how we get parallelism, right? So this is how we make these systems scale out. If I add one more machine to the system, I get one more worker, I get one more thread of execution. You know, so I get to do more tasks. On the other hand, you know, there's numerous challenges having to do with concurrency, like race conditions, you know, deadlocks, and of course complexity of just trying to engineer this thing. And the last one I have on here is partial failures. So uh, one interesting thing with bad distributed systems is that you know, if you include more machines, uh, your, the likelihood of some machine failing actually goes up. Right? And so if your system includes a thousand machines, like some of these systems in Google, then you have failures all the time, like every day. Right? So on the one hand, uh, this is a problem. On the other hand, you know, this is only a partial failure. So as one machine fails, the rest of your system can keep going. Right? So this gives it a nice fault tolerance. So as you add more machines, you actually make the system more fault tolerant, even though overall the number of failures increases in your system. Of course, the drawback here is you have, you have to design this failure recovery. It's a very complex process. So you know, how do you keep going you know, as a distributed application, even though you know, some of these machines keep failing? Right? So this is my take on kind of the, the core features that I think are, are central to distributed systems that you have to keep in mind when you, when you build them. Um, so clearly, there's a bunch of challenges. And um, you know, within the research community, people have worked very hard on trying to make it easier to build distributed systems. And many of the techniques uh, that exist for dealing with these challenges come from kind of traditional software engineering domain. So the way you would build a sequential system would be, you know, you take that technique like testing, for example, and then you'd apply it in the distributed system context. And so numerous research papers, most of them in the last, you know, 10 years have focused on making distributed systems uh, more robust. I'm not going to kind of go through these, but just to give you an idea of, you know, the, the fact that, you know, this is a, a very active research area, 
And uh, there's a huge interest from industry as well. So it's, a, it's kind of like a nice niche to work in. The topics that I care about are actually at the very bottom here. These are, these are the things that are the focus of my work and that I'm going to talk about today. So you know, I think of log analysis, tracing, and visualization as being sort of really in the really available to us in the medium, medium term, right? So things like verification and uh, model checking, these are fairly heavyweight techniques that will take you know, a lot of perfecting before they get used. Whereas log analysis, well, lots of companies collect logs. They all have logs. They kind of need to solve this problem immediately. Um, whereas verification, people are you know, not as keen on applying this immediately. So this is, that's why I like to focus on, on these three topics. And in my work, I built a bunch of different tools. Um, and you know, within this talk, I don't have time to cover all of them. So I'm really going to focus on uh, just a couple. And these two kind of go hand in hand. Uh, the first tool is a tool for augmenting logs, in some sense, mm -hmm. instrumenting your system in order to capture a little, bit, uh, a little bit of the ordering information that exists in the distributed system. And then the second tool is a visualization tool, although underneath it also has a bunch of interesting analysis that it exposes in order for you to better understand what the system actually has done. So that's really going to be the focus of my talk uh, today. OK, so, uh, so log analysis. So you know, think of log analysis in a distributed context very much like the way you, you know, write a program and do log analysis today in a sequential context. So you write the program, you run it, uh, you have some printf statements in the program, it generates a log, a console log. You look at it, you try to understand what went on, you go back, you perhaps add more printf statements and so on, right? So really this is kind of the state of the art right now in distributed systems as well. So you know, I have my application that runs across three machines, and so because it's across three machines, I get three different logs, right? I get three files. And now in order to figure out what went on in my system, I need to somehow reconstruct the execution by piecing it together across these three files. Right? So this is the really big challenge for log analysis in distributed systems, because there really is no way to link events across the different uh, logs. You know, the other challenge is that it's hard to understand what is the underlying communication topology within my system. So the log messages themselves have a certain interleaving to them, have concurrency. And so as a result, it's uh, difficult to tell you know, what happened before something else and what is the actual communication pattern. And the last one is really, really difficult today to, to do today. So if I, if I have a bug in my system and I try to fix it, how do I know that I actually fixed this bug? Really, from a log analysis perspective, what you want to do is compare the two logs to each other and actually see the difference and say, oh, OK, the <laughs> log, you know, this log indicates, the difference indicates that the bug is gone. So today, there are really no tools to facilitate this process. OK, so uh, the two tools, Shevector and Chavis, kind of uh, change the process in the following way. So uh, Shevector is uh, this tool here on the left um, that intercepts communication and then injects uh, vector timestamps into the log messages. So you actually get a slightly different log, a log that contains a little bit of extra metadata. And then this metadata information is used on the Chavez size, where it's actually used to visualize the partial order information within your system. Um, and so really, Chavez is aimed at you know, solving those three challenges, which is helping developers understand the ordering of events in a system, uh, querying for patterns, and also supporting uh, comparison. So these are the two things I'll talk about. Uh, to start with, I'll talk about uh, Chavector and how it instruments uh, distributed systems. Uh, I'm actually going to go in sort of fairly close detail to explain the vector uh, clock mechanism. So those of, those of you who are familiar with it can kind of tune me out. But if this is new to you, then uh, pay attention. So one way to motivate vector clocks is to consider the following hypothetical example. Right? So assume you have uh, a multi-threaded system. You have two threads. Uh, T1 generates an event A. T2 generates event B. And then you know, these two threads uh, log these events through some kind of logger. So the events are serialized. And so your resulting log looks like this. On line 1, you have event A. On line 2, you have event B. And now the question for all, all of you is, you know, now that you see this log, you know, which world am I in? Assuming that time is going down and that I can basically have this time-space diagram where each line indicates a thread of activity, you know, did A happen before B? Did A happen concurrently with B? 
or did B precede A? So as a developer, you'll be looking at this log, trying to figure out which one of these three worlds you're in. So probably the first thing you'll do is eliminate this last, last case, right? So clearly here, B happened before A. Well, that contradicts what I'm observing in the log, right? Because A happened before B, supposedly. But now you still have this question of choosing between the two. So how many of you think it's, it's, it's this one? What about this one, the middle? Well, it's actually a, a trick question because it could be either one of those. Right? So in a distributed system, um, you have <laughs> concurrency. right? And so it's actually insufficient information. You can't tell which world you're operating in based on the total order information within the log. So now, <laughs> now you can kind of see the debugging challenge here. right? So if I create this totally ordered log and I can't tell whether the two events were concurrent or whether one preceded the other, how can I do any of the other tasks, you know, the more advanced tasks within the debugging context? Right? So you can think of this as, you know, x had some value, then y has some value, right? Was the, this x, the setting x actually cause y, right? Because this is a precondition for causality. Or were the two, uh, you know, rights to those two variables concurrent? Right? That kind of question you can't answer with that log. So this is where vector clocks come in. And essentially, vector clocks allow us to dis distinguish between these possibilities. Uh, so here I added these little uh, integers within brackets. That's a vector clock. And they basically allow you to tell which world you're in. And uh, invented by Leslie Lamport, uh, and then kind of refined in the 80s to actually uh, have their vector forms. And I'll kind of quickly give you a tour of this and explain how they work exactly. So, uh, the context here is I'm going to draw a lot of these diagrams uh, where you know each line is a thread of execution, and then you know a local event will appear by itself, and then a send event will have uh, an edge <laughs> emitted from it, and then receive will receive some some event. Right, so that's my notation. So in this context, uh, the vector clock algorithm works as follows: you initialize uh, the vector clocks to be zero zero zero. So because there are three threads. I'm going to have three integers to denote the knowledge about the logical time at the different hosts. So uh, the C sub 1 is going to denote the clock at you know, thread 1, and it's going to be 0, 0, 0. And then when I have a local event that occurs on the host, I'm going to increment the integer that corresponds to that thread. Right? So this integer in the first position corresponds to T1, so I'm going to increment it, and it's going to be 1. And that clock is now associated with the event that occurred on thread one. If I have local event at thread two and thread three, then I also increment their respective integers and kind of associate that timestamp with that local event. Okay, so you notice that all of these timestamps, they're all different. Okay, so when communication occurs, well, a communication event is a local event, so I just increment the clock correspondingly, so now one becomes two, right? And on receipt, I'm actually gonna do a slightly more complex operation. I'm going to merge the two clocks. So I'm going to take the clock from T1. I'm going to take the clock from T2, the latest ones. And then I'm going to merge them. And the merging process basically respects this equation where you're going to take the max of every index. So the max of 2 and 0 is 2. So the result is going to be 2. And then because this is a local event, I'm going to increment this 1 to be 2. And then the max of 0 and 0 is also 0. So the resulting timestamp is 2, 2, 0. So this procedure essentially requires uh, thread 1 to communicate its vector clock to thread 2. But this allows you to then reconstruct this partial order. So you know, as you follow it along, the clock just kind of keeps being transmitted. So one way of thinking about um, you know, each of these clock values is that it's local knowledge about the set of events that have already occurred at a different host. So this number 2 here summarizes the fact that you know, G uh, was, came after both A and B. Right? Because the timestamp of B is 2, so the fact that G also has 2 in the first position indicates that it has that knowledge. So you can keep doing this and kind of basically build up this graph. And then there's a little bit of math that allows you to uh, draw conclusions based on these vector timestamps. So for example, one thing I can do is actually derive a total ordering of events. 
So something that I couldn't do before in the context of a total order with no vector timestamps. So here I know that uh, A, D, E, F, H, I, you know, occurred exactly in this order, right? And I can totally order them by using a little bit of math on the vector timestamps. And notice that this total order forms a contiguous path within this, within this graph, right? So it sort of corresponds intuitively to what you would think of as a, a total order. You can also use vector clocks to determine concurrency. So the case where before where I told you about the two threads, you can actually differentiate between the context where the two events uh, you know, occurred in a total order and the context where they were concurrent. So in this case, uh, D, C, and B are three events and they're all you know, occurring concurrently because of their vector timestamps. And notice that there is no contiguous path. So no information could have been exchanged between them, which kind of induces concurrency. You know, it explains why they're concurrent. So this is my basic overview for vector clocks. I know this is kind of quick and there's a lot of details, but you know, if you're interested, you can learn more about it. So essentially what Shevector does is it injects vector timestamps into the log. So you might have a system that has a log file with like console log, and then essentially that system instrumented with Shevector will give you the same log, except that on every line now, you will have this vector timestamp. And this vector's timestamp is added you know, transparently, so the system itself is not changed. Okay, so this is basically, you know, explains what Shevector does. Um, and then on the Shevis side, we're going to take this log as input and actually visualize it and expose a bunch of functionality for the developer that they'll be able to utilize. Um, so I think here I have this kind of end-to-end -end example of how, how you would put these together. So here's two programs, um, and I just put them out in time. You know, so time still goes from top to bottom. And so you have a bunch of log statements, and then you have a little bit of communication, right, where client may send some message to the server, the server sends a reply back, right? So using the vector timestamp algorithm, you can now associate a vector timestamp with every one of these log statements. So essentially, your log, you know, for this first line, for example, connecting, is going to look like this now. And notice that there is a, a bit of uh, JSON that kind of encodes the vector timestamp associated with that log line. And so these orange lines are for the client, the, the green ones are for the server. And so it's essentially the vector timestamp algorithm applied you know, to this context. Okay, so now that you've generated this log with Shevector, you can take it, compose it together, and then give it to Shevis. The one other thing that Chavez would require is that you actually have to tell it approximate format of the log. So in this context, if you're familiar with regular expressions, this basically says, well, the first line, uh, you know, is a capture group of event. So this describes some event, like listening. And then what you have on the next line is the, you know, something that denotes the host, so server or client. And then the thing that follows it is going to be the clock, the vector clock timestamp. So all of these are built-in regular expression groups, capture groups, that basically know how to interpret the, the, that input. So the clock there, for example, knows that this is going to be in some JSON format where the individual fields have to be you know, server and client, right? have to be hosts that it knows about. So using that information, Shabiz can then you know, proceed to visualize, visualize the log. So this is where I get to switch out, out of the presentation and actually show you a bit of a demo of how it works. So, um, so hopefully the internet's still working. Um, so this uh, this page is hosted online. It basically you know allows you to input a log and utilize Chavez if your log was generated by Chavector or some tool that it you know contains vector timestamps. So, you know, here I'm going to try out Chavez and. basically add this, I guess you can't really see it. So you can add this log, which is exactly the log that you saw within the presentation. And then I'm also gonna need to specify the regular expression for this log. So I have these prepared here. You know, you can upload a file. Uh, you have a couple of options on how you uh, actually show processes. But once you click on this large visualization button, you basically get the graph, the communication graph, for that system that generated this log. So basically, based on 
you know, prior to using Shavector, you would have a console log, which would prevent you from actually, you know, knowing anything about the order. But now with Shavector, you can actually <laughs> understand the, the relative ordering of events within your distributed system. So each of these, sub, just to explain what you're looking at, you know, the box at the top denotes the, the process name. So this is a server, and then this one is going to be the client. And then each of the bubbles is actually an event. Right? So in this case, the event is listening on the server, and then the server received the message, sent the message, and then you know, sent the reply. So you can sort of track events as they occur between the two hosts. So of course, for this log, it's fairly simplistic. So perhaps you don't need, actually, this tool for such a simple distributed system, right? where it's just the client server interacting. But really, in truth, in more complex logs, you actually do need it. And so um, I'm going to show you a couple of systems where that's the case. So here's a, here's a more advanced example uh, taken from, there's a couple of examples that are loaded at the top. And uh, this is a large log, right? It just keeps going. <laughs> uh, and the regular expression that I'm using here is a little bit more advanced. Um, you can't quite read it, but I'll show you actually the metadata that it parses out. Uh, when you visualize this log, you'll get a picture such as this, where each of these boxes at the top is actually different threads with, within the Voldemort application. Voldemort um, is actually, probably none of you know what Voldemort is. It's an open source uh, distributed system that implements the Amazon Dynamo system. So Dynamo is a, was an academic project that was published and then is utilized within Amazon. And then what Voldemort did is actually build the open source mm -hmm. version of it. And so we've uh, instrumented the test cases within Voldemort you know, with, uh, with the Shevector tool and then collected this log. And so that's what you're looking at. So here you can tell that, well, if I had a log for every one of these boxes, right, it would be really difficult to actually reason about <laughs> you know, what happened when. So to give you an example, uh, Shevez actually collapses, collapses local events that uh, occurred without any communication. So here you can see that there's uh, 792 collapsed events. If I expand them out, then uh, these blue events now appear on the left. And if I scroll <laughs> down, you'll see that actually these events just keep going. <laughs> so most of the log is composed of events from this one thread. And one interesting bit about it is that you can tell that it never communicates with any other thread. So there's no interaction, no synchronization actions that actually relate this thread to the activity in the rest of the system. Right? So that's really useful information because now you know that if you fix this part of the system, it's actually never going to be impacting this thread, at least not through the communication channels. Um, a couple of, so I can, I can collapse this thing. One thing to note is that um, you, know, you couldn't see the regular expressions before, but if you click on these, you'll see a number of fields. So you can use the regular expression interface to parse out a little bit of metadata associated with the events. So for example, you may care about, OK, so when did it happen, this event, in real time? And so that would be the date. You can also have a path you know, or the priority, the logging priority, like info, warning, and so forth. So this associates more metadata with each of the events that you can then uh, use within Chavez um, for different things. So uh, for example, one thing you can do is you can search for things. So within Chavez, you have two kinds of search capabilities. And this sort of relates to this um, you know, challenge that I talked about earlier, which is how do I find you know, patterns that I care about within my log you know, that my distributed system actually uh, executed? So one thing I can do is I can just search you know, for words. So I can search for the word initializing. And if I, if I create that search, then it'll actually highlight just the events that contain that keyword. Right? So this is like a really trivial thing that you would expect a tool like this to have. So it, here it's highlighting the fact that you know, this, this, the word initialized appeared in log lines associated with just this one thread, right? did not appear anywhere else. And as you scroll down, you'll see that, well, okay, <coughs> it, it kind of occurs intermittingly. Right? Every now and then, you get a bunch of initialized statements. So this is easy to see. Uh, one thing you could do is that it supports kind of a regular expression format where you can search for um, regular expressions that constrain the fields that you've parsed out. So for example, here you'll notice that priority field uh, contains info. But, um, or maybe let's choose, let's choose a more interesting one, like, uh, like host. Right? There's this field host that actually tells you 
what is the underlying thread representing a host that executed the event. So you can, you can say host is equal to NAO client one, for instance, or NAO star. So in this case, I have to wrap it in little <coughs> slashes because it's a regular expression. So in this case, this is a regular expression, right, that will match all of the events that have this field, you know, matching this regular expression. So you have a little bit more uh, expressiveness in terms of the things you can actually search for with your keyword search. You know, another cool thing here is that you can actually search for communication patterns that you care about. Um, so for this, I'll, I'll actually use a slightly different log, which is a reliable broadcast log, which is slightly smaller, but has, uh, yeah, you can sort of see it. It has really crazy communication patterns <laughs> throughout, so it's very difficult to tell what is going on. So in this context, reliable broadcast <coughs> is really just broadcast, except that it makes sure that every node receives the message, right? So there's lots of algorithms that implement this, um, and when you've implemented an algorithm like that, it's difficult to tell that you've actually gotten it right. So in this context, what you would search for with a structured search is the actual broadcast, right? So there would be the broadcast topology within the communication topology of your log. So for example, at the top, you can tell that, um, you know, this node uh, actually sends these two messages to these two other nodes. So this is considered a broadcast pattern, right? And this broadcast pattern can look in, you know, in different ways at different nodes. So here, uh, the broadcast pattern is slightly different because it's initiated by this middle thread. So you can kind of search for these different communication patterns, including, um, including custom patterns. So for example, I can compose a pattern where you know, a node sends a message and then um, sends a message to a different node. So this is a little bit crude because you have to, you have to kind of draw this thing. So in this case, I have a kind of custom-defined topological search where I'm looking for relationships within this graph that match the following format. There's a little bit more kind of complex operations you can do, but this is kind of the basic one. And so here I am, I've searched for essentially the same topology, right, which is broadcast, except that now I've specified exactly what I'm expecting. So for instance, you know, if I search for a broadcast that involved uh, four nodes, Right, then of course I'm not gonna get any, any results because I have uh, zero instances founded because I have just three nodes, right? Just have three threads within this, this context. So that topology was not found. So this is, uh, this is one kind of set of operations within this tool which allows you to search for interesting patterns. Uh, another set of operations have to do with actually transforming this graph in different ways. So one thing you may care about when you look at this is to say, well, you know, I care about, you know, processes that communicate with a process I care about. So, for example, NIO client, I can filter by this node in order to observe a subset of my total graph, right, that includes just the host that communicates to this one host. And notice that I'm using host process thread interchangeably because it really depends on, you know, the, the thread of execution, the, the granularity at which you're looking at. So in this case, you know, I have a bunch of processes that are here on the, on the right-hand side that are hidden from view because they're irrelevant, you know, to my inspection of this NAO client. So basically by using this filtering technique, I'm able to scope down the, log, the, sc the scale of the log that I, you know, have to inspect if I care about particular communication behavior. And these sorts of transformations are nested. So I can filter by two nodes, for instance, right? So I can say, okay, what is the communication that occurs between, that touches both of these threads, right? And that will include those three hosts. Um, another, another thing, uh, let me unfilter <laughs> to bring back this huge graph. Um, another thing you can do is just hide uh, some of these process timelines from you altogether. So you might say, well, I don't care about this you know, process timeline, so I'm going to just remove it from you. And so you can keep doing this for all the, all the processes you don't care about, which will essentially just move them off to the right. And as you do that, you know, your log on the left will reflect the fact that they're no longer visible. Right? So now the blue events that were all over the place before, 
uh, are no longer on the left. If I bring it back, then you'll notice that the blue events you know, are now interspersed within my log. So as you do this kind of functionality, I, know if, I don't know if you can see it as well. It's a little bit light or faint. But you, know, you get to see interesting new lines, <laughs> uh, the semantics for which are, are, are different. So here you have a dashed line between two events which actually indicates a transitive communication pattern. So it means that there is order between these two events, except that the ordering is not direct. It occurs through some intermediate host, which is not shown in this graph. Right? So in this case, one of these two processes facilitated you know, an ordering relationship between these two events. But you can't show it directly. So basically, as you transform the graph, it sort of retains some of this latent knowledge that still underlies, underlies the topology. So the last sort of feature I will show you uh, is, is the ability to compare things. So one of the, one of the motivations for log analysis that I gave uh, earlier was that you know, if I have a one execution, you know, okay, maybe I can piece it together. And I can kind of string together the ordering you know, between the different events of my host. But what if I have multiple executions? What if I have two of them? And then, in that case, I actually want to compare them and say, what is different between them? So this is something that we've added to Chavez. And uh, in this case, there is a, there's a Facebook log with multiple execution example, which um, you know, requires that you actually specify uh, another regular expression, which is going to be the delimiter for executions. So if you have multiple executions within one file, you kind of have to tell Chavez, you know, here's one execution, here's a new one. And for that, there's this regular expression. So when you visualize it, initially you kind of, it looks the same, right? Essentially here's execution one. And in this log, there's two of them. So I can switch over and see execution two, right? So I can kind of see them uh, one at a time as before. But a new capability is to actually be able to see them pairwise, side by side. So in this case, my execution one is on the left, execution two is on the right. And as I scroll down through the log, I can actually get to see them you know, compare it side by side. And of course, the same thing happens for the two logs. And you'll notice that one is longer, right? So clearly, there's some difference <laughs> between these two executions, right? So by just by looking at it, it may be difficult to tell where the difference actually is. So uh, we also have a bit of analysis in this tool that allows you to show the differences. So if you click on this button to the right, uh, the Show Differences button is going to create new kinds of nodes, which look like these rhombuses. Um, which the semantics for which basically is that you know this event occurs on this timeline and has never occurred on the corresponding timeline of the other execution, right? So it tells you you know that this event is unique to this execution and does not occur on the other execution. So it basically tells you okay this event occurred and that's the actual difference between the the two logs. And so it'll highlight all of the nodes that have that property. So here's another one. So this, this sort of uh, visual cue can help you spot differences between the logs. Right? This tells you where to look if you want to understand what's different between the two executions. Um, there's a bunch more features, um, some of which are somewhat experimental, uh, like motifs and clusters. Um, in this case, I actually don't have a good example log to demonstrate them. So I'm not, I'm not going to talk about them. Um, but that basically, this, this more or less concludes my demo you know, to give you an idea of what this tool is like. So the, the big takeaway here is that you know, just by adding vector timestamps to your log, right, you make this log much, much more interesting to developers. Because a lot of, you know, notice that I didn't actually change the content of the log itself. I've just instrumented to add the vector timestamps. So the content install itself is still here. So as a developer, this is still very much familiar to you. Right? You've written all of these log messages. So you can query for them, right? you can search for them, and you can understand the semantics underlying these bubbles. Right? So, uh, so really what Chavez and Chavector add is the ability to reason about this log in the context of this partial order graph. Okay, so to switch over, uh, basically, I told you about this approach where you can instrument a log generated by a distributed system with vector timestamps and then visualize it using Chavez. Of course, Chavez is not just visualization, right? It includes a bunch of these other features that I, that I talked about. Um, and this is my last slide. Right? So, uh, you know, the, 
the ultimate kind of driving question for a lot of my work, and I think a lot of uh, interesting work within the space is, you know, why does my distributed system work in a particular way? Right? This is a question that is very difficult to answer today. You essentially have to collect logs and then stare at them to try to understand what is going on in your system. And so to answer this question, uh, you know, my approach is to instrument the system. And an example of that is the Shavector tool. And then to analyze the resulting log. And that's really the Shaviz tool. So the Shaviz tool, you know, it's, it's very much a visual tool. So it's really facilitating uh, kind of visual understanding of the log. Uh, but the nice thing about it is that it includes a bunch of transformations, a bunch of these uh, fairly advanced functionality uh, that, you know, reflect visually and can help you better understand the log. Um, so this tool is open source. It's online. So feel free to check it out. And I think I'll stop at this point. I'll take, take your questions. Yeah, I, yeah. I guess in that case, they would be very different, you know, because they're very distinct systems. Yeah, I, um, you know, one thing. I mean, I, I didn't have a limitation slide, so you guys should push me on. You know, what is this thing not good for? So, you know, one challenge here is that because it's visual, it's uh, naturally, you know, scoped to uh, conveying a finite amount of information, right? Like, just visually, it's very difficult to fit in a thousand different timelines, right? Or you know, millions of log events. And so it's really, you know, I think it's, this tool is really useful in the small, not as useful in the large. So, it, you know, it, it will be helpful for comparing systems with respect to some very well-defined behavior that you know about, but maybe not in general, right? So you probably can't, like, throw in, you know, the Google file system and just expect to visualize it using this tool. I think that would be much too big of a, you know, of a task for such a tool. So this, this is all, uh, well, you know, depends. So Shivector actually is a, it run, instruments a runtime, you know, of the system. So as you execute the system, it actually imposes a bit of overhead in order to, you know, add these vector timestamps and to track them. But then the resulting log is visualized by Shiviz offline. So offline in the sense that, you know, the system may continue to run, you know, and you do your analysis in a different space in the browser. So we found that actually the browsers today are uh, extremely powerful. So they're capable of doing all of this analysis, you know, locally within on your on your machine. Um, of course, the question is, you know, is is that is that going to be true going forward? Although I think that you know, having said before that, there's finite amount of information that you can convey. So I think the browser is more than enough. Yeah. Yeah. How to make it work for bigger systems? Well, you know, this multi. This idea of uh, being able to handle multiple executions is one approach to that. Right? So perhaps it's not, you know, I think there's a finite amount of information you can show, but you know, uh, you can generate more and more executions. And so some of the features I didn't talk about actually are there to handle multiple executions. So for example, um, you might have you know, 50 executions, and your question may be, uh, you know, what are, the, what are the clusters within this set of executions? Which executions are similar and which ones are different? Right? Are all of them identical, right? Or are there some that are, you know, especially unique? And so some of that functionality is what we're what we're working on moving forward. There's a question on this side somewhere, I think. Maybe? Maybe it disappeared. So when are you selling this to Google? <laughs> when am I selling it to Google? Well, you know, I really believe in, in the power of open source and tools, tool support for everyone. So um, I think one of the reasons we don't have tools, you know, in this space is that um, tools are, <laughs> you know, it's, it doesn't pay to develop tools, really. You know, like, uh, it pays to develop new systems that give you new capabilities, but then not really tools that help you debug those systems or verify them or actually make them, you know, more, more correct. Um, so, you know, my, I think as an academic, it actually gives you the ability to work on some of these things that are underappreciated but are just as important, right? And so I, I consider this tool as an, as an example of that. Um, so no, you know, no plans for any financial you know, domination of this <laughs> visualization of distributed system market <laughs> at this time. The NSA has its own tools, right? I'm, I'm sure it does, yeah, <laughs> for visualizing logs. There's a question back there. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, yeah, the question is, does this have to actually change, you know, all of the nodes in my distributed system, or can it just influence, impact some nodes? Uh, so the answer is uh, yes and no. <laughs> it depends on what you're after, right? So it clearly has to change the messaging format within my distributed system. But you could define a boundary, right, where you're tracking vector clocks, you know, beyond which the vector clocks don't escape. So within the Gmail example, for example, you may not want to uh, track vector clocks between the system and the client because it may expose you know, things about your inner distributed system. And so at that point, you would uh, basically strip the vector clocks as you send messages to the browser, right? And then just collect the, the logs for your system. So you can set it up such that it just collects logs for you know, the, the nodes that you care about. Yeah, so yeah, the, the original Lampert clock is just one, one integer, right? And uh, the integer allows you to tell whether two things are concurrent, you know, and, um, or whether they're totally ordered, right? It basically allows you to, to derive the total order within your system. Uh, you actually do need vector clocks if you want to um, come up with the actual topology, you know, the complete topology, which is what we're using. I should say, though, that, you know, vector clocks are from the 80s. There's been a bunch of research since then that actually have been looking at optimizing the vector, vector clock algorithm itself. So there's some things that are known as hierarchical vector clocks, where you can essentially associate you know, one of these indices with a group of nodes. Right? So instead of having one index per host, you would have like a group of hosts associated with one index. And so that, it's, in some sense, it in introduces abstraction into your temporal domain. Right? So this one, one timeline here may actually represent you know, the network file system or the Google file system. Right? as one entity. And that might make sense if you actually don't care about the Google file system, right? Like you may care about what you know this other system does, but it interacts with this file system. And so in this sense, it sort of collapses nodes that you don't, you don't care about. So there's a bunch of other uh, basically algorithms that you can kind of drop into Shivak. 